It's time to talk about the Big Bang Theory. No, not the TV show, the actual thing. The Big Bang... Theory. We have discussed it, you know, obliquely from different directions, but I've never actually provided any real evidence behind it. I see, you know, we've done a little bit, okay, this is the... the but no, we haven't actually done it, so now is now's the time. Let's get into the meat of it, because... First of all, it's, it's this amazing discovery. It's one of the greatest developments in astronomy in the last hundred years. And it's also a wonderful example of the scientific method at work. You know, what's the scientific method? Well, you know, we observe the universe and look for patterns. And look for patterns. We then, when we find the patterns, we come up with hypotheses and theories to explain these. Hypotheses, and then we test the theories out. We test our hypotheses rigorously. They have to make some specific predictions that we can test. Predict and test. And then if the test works, then you take the hypothesis a little more seriously and you go on from there. The, the, the Big Bang Theory is a wonderful, wonderful example of this. Um, not because it's, you know, step one, step two, step three. That's too simple. No, but we got all these things going on. People gathering data, people developing theories, data and theories interacting, people trying to make sense out of the universe in a logical, rigorous, serious, mathematical way. And that's, that's what's going on here. I mean, I guess... The fundamental assumption of science is that most people are wrong most of the time. So no new discovery, new observation is taken seriously unless lots of other people can double check it and measure and verify and say, okay, yes, this is real. No theory, no hypothesis is taken seriously unless it can make lots of very specific testable predictions, things I can go to my telescope, I can go into the laboratory and test and observe and measure and verify that, yeah, this is for real. This isn't just something made up in someone's mind. All right, so we got to set the stage. So, all right, so... What did people think a hundred years ago, long before this idea? Well, philosophers had considered this idea of the beginning of the universe, the creation of all things, and they decided there was no beginning. So, here's the background. Background. Philosophers like René Descartes, back in the 1600s, a contemporary, an influence on Isaac Newton. You know, so we're going back to the 17th century. And here's what philosophers had decided. Philosophers thought all this thing over. You know, they considered the religious angle and they thought, well, psh, no, time, time is this continuous thing. Every day has a yesterday. Every day has a tomorrow. So that means that since it's, it's inconceivable to us that there could have been a beginning to the universe, a point where the universe came into existence. No, 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 no. My observations of now, time seems totally continuous. So time the universe must be infinitely old infinitely old the universe must have been around forever basically i mean the, the method of philosophy is if it's con inconceivable it must be wrong you know so then they they throw it out this is the difference between philosophy and science science we have to test it out but no they imagine it they think about it mm, that doesn't make any sense to me so therefore the universe is infinitely old similarly they think that the universe is infinitely big how could there be an end to space again that's equally inconceivable how could there be an edge to the universe no the universe must be infinitely old and go on infinitely in all directions and that's true because i think it's true because it seems logical to me because it makes sense to me so that was what was going on for hundreds of years this idea the beginning of the universe that wasn't science you know science is about things you can observe you can test, you can measure, you can verify. Nobody was there. You know, this is whatever happened long before people were around. So, no, no, the beginning of the universe, this is a place for philosophers to think it out and figure it out. And so for hundreds of years, people figured the universe must be infinitely old and infinitely big, and that's how it is. But there's a problem with that. It's a problem we call this, so, so there's a problem with the infinitely big, infinitely old universe. So, problem with infinitely big, infinitely old universe idea. We call this problem, we call it Olber's Paradox. O-L-B-E-R-S Paradox. Olbers wrote about this in, what, 1823, something like that, although he was not the first person to, to talk about it. Johannes Kepler discussed this idea, and here's the problem. If the universe is infinitely big and infinitely old and infinitely filled with stars, infinitely in all directions, well, when I go out at the night sky and point my eye in some direction, 
there's going to be a star in that direction because, you know, that's infinitely old, infinitely big, infinitely stars in every direction. So sooner or later in every direction, there should be a star. So why shouldn't, why is the whole night sky dark? That's Olber's paradox. Why is the night sky mostly dark? I mean, you got a few stars here and there, but overall, most of the night sky is dark. And if the universe really is infinitely big, filled in, with an infinite number of stars, is infinitely old in all directions, then in every direction you should meet a star somewhere. And there's been plenty of time for light to get here from there, so you would expect the whole night sky to be glowing as brightly as the surface of the sun. And then so the people discuss this, you know, kind of science-y, philosopher -y people talk about this idea. Eh, this doesn't make sense. And, well, maybe there's dust out there blocking starlight, but yeah, okay, over time the dust would warm up and then it would start to glow and uh, it doesn't work. So people are aware that there's some problems about that, but they don't know how to resolve it and the philosophers are like, no, no, no. There was no beginning. There was no moment of creation, anything like that. Psh, that's foolish religious superstition, blah, blah, blah. No, no, no. We're philosophers. We think about these things. You know, the, every day had a yesterday. Every day has a tomorrow. The universe is infinitely old. So this is what's going on there. And people are kicking it around. And there's this problem, but nobody quite knows how to answer it. And life goes on. Einstein. In 1905, Einstein comes up with his special theory of relativity. It's all about, you know, the speed of light and what makes the speed of light special and why you can't go the speed of light and all that sort of thing. And then, a few years later, Einstein comes up with his general theory of relativity. General theory of relativity. This is a theory of gravity. It's a new theory of gravity. Basically, it, 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 you know, it, takes Einstein, it takes Newton's theory of gravity, which everybody thought was the one and true and last and only theory of gravity forever, and then Einstein shows that, no, that's just an approximation to a deeper theory. And in Einstein's theory of gravity, he finds that basically space itself is bent by gravity, and that as an object has gravity, it warps the space around it. So space becomes rather than just this static canvas on which everything is pointed. No, now instead space becomes something that is bendable, that is malleable. And so based on this, Einstein predicts that, aha, as a result of this, this should tweak Mercury's orbit and make Mercury orbit a little bit differently. And it does. And so that worked out. And Einstein said, ah, as a result of this, starlight should be bent by gravity. Now, according to Newton, you know, Newton says gravity is a force between all two masses. Light doesn't have mass, so light should ignore gravity. Einstein says, no, gravity bends space itself. So when light goes through curved space, it must be bent by gravity. There's this great eclipse in 1919 where the moon passes in front of the sun and people take a picture and say, Aha! Look, the stars are, are, are the, the starlight has been bent by the sun's gravity. Einstein's right. We got this new theory of gravity. Hooray! Hooray! Einstein becomes famous. All this kind of stuff. But Einstein sees a problem. He says he realizes that according to his equations, according to this idea of his new theory of gravity, the universe cannot be standing still. The universe cannot stand. Still, if you have an infinitely big universe, then, you know, well, by Newton's theory, okay, if I got an infinite number of stars to the right of me and an infinite number of stars to the left of me, they're going to balance out and I can just stand still. And so that's fine. So everybody's cool with that. But then Einstein says, no, gravity bends space itself. So if I've got all these infinite stars scattered throughout space, well, then their gravity is going to bend space together. And that would cause all the stars to eventually come together and collapse. Or if they had some initial momentum, they, 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 all the stars could be expanding away from each other. They could be expanding, contracting. They couldn't be standing still. This is a key idea. And Einstein is really bothered by this because remember Einstein is a well you know, he's born in Ulm, Germany. He's a well-educated European of his day. He knows all this stuff about philosophers. He knows his philosophy. He knows the universe is infinitely old. Everybody knows the universe is infinitely old. It's always been around. Remember, people still don't know anything about nuclear fusion and stars and all this. This is 100 years ago. And so he's very bothered by his theory seems to be contradicting what we know from the philosophers to be a, a, a definite fact. There was no beginning to the universe. So what does he do? He worries about this. He bothers about this. And he looks in his equations and he finds a place where he can stick in an extra term, kind of a fudge factor. And he says, aha, empty space has pressure. 
empty space has pressure. So he adds this term to his equations, which calls, he calls a cosmological constant. And he says, ah, this is going to fix the equation. So now this pressure of empty space will balance the inward pull of gravity, and mm, that will make the universe stand still and have no beginning and no ending. It can be infinitely old and you know unchanging and static and eternal, as we all know it is. So he publishes this. He's very happy. He's quite self-satisfied with himself. A couple of other mathematicians come along and say, you know, Einstein, even this doesn't work. This would only allow the universe to stand still for an instant, and then it would be unstable. It would either then start, you know, start expanding, and then the pressure of empty space, the cosmological constant, would win, or then it would fail, and then, you know, it would all collapse together. So ev even that. So the universe cannot stand still is what he finds from equations. He adds a co an extra term. He turned to his equations to try to fix them and make the universe do what the philosophers say it should do. Fails. Can't do it. Doesn't know what to do. Life goes on. Some other people start studying Einstein's theory of relativity and start thinking about this. Hmm, they're playing with this. They're playing with this. Um, there was a Russian physicist, Alexander Friedman, who just kind of, he was a, he was not a physicist, he was a mathematician. He studied the Einstein equations and he saw, oh, these would allow for different types of expanding and contracting solutions. But in his paper, he, first of all, he published in Russia, and so a few people heard about it. And also, he wasn't really thinking about the being, the real universe. He was just playing math games. Another observation takes place. Vesto Slipher, an American astronomer, he's studying other galaxies, and he finds that basically almost all the other galaxies in the world are redshifted by the Doppler shift. Their beams of light have been stretched out by the fact that they're moving away from each other. He's an astronomer. He finds that most galaxies in the universe, galaxies, are going away from us. He's doing this in the 19 teens, so uh, you know, somewhere around 1915, 1920, this sort of thing. And so the Doppler shifts, so all their absorption lines are all at longer wavelengths than they should be. Basically, most of the galaxies in the universe are moving away from us. Interesting. And then you would think that if the universe was static and eternal and unchanging, well, about half a galaxy should be moving towards us, half moving away. Hmm, but there seems to be most of them are moving away. Interesting. Galaxies are moving away. I wonder what that means. Next character, Georges Lemaitre, L-E-M-A-I-T-R-E. -E. He was a uh, Belgian. He was from Belgium. He was a Roman Catholic priest, a Jesuit, studied all this sort of thing, became a scientist priest, one, you know, stud, did a lot of work at MIT, cool stuff like this. And he takes Einstein's equation and he said, let's take Einstein's equation seriously. He's aware that galaxies are moving away from us, and he says, Maybe we don't need this fudge factor. Maybe Einstein's equations are right. Maybe our universe is not static and unchanging. Maybe our universe really is expanding. Okay, so considers idea of expanding universe. Maybe, you know, Einstein's equations are right. Maybe they don't need a fudge factor. Maybe our universe is not static. Maybe it's not fixed and eternal and unchanging. Maybe it's changing. And he's aware of the fact that galaxies are moving away from us. And so he does math. And based on this math, he says, okay, if our universe is expanding in the way that Einstein's equations would, you know, in accordance with Einstein's equations, then basically what would happen is that the farther away a galaxy is, the faster it would be moving away from us. So all galaxies, you know, except for the relatively nearby ones, would be moving away from us. And then the farther away it is, the faster it would be. So if you plotted out distance versus velocity of galaxies and put one point down for each galaxy, well, there'd be some random scatter, because every galaxy's got its random peculiar velocity. But in general, you're going to find a straight line relationship there. The farther away a galaxy is, the faster it's moving. He publishes this, and he does his work in 1928 publishes it in 1929, he says, the universe really is expanding. It's not fixed, unchanging, static, and eternal. It's expanding. And that same year, later in 1929, Edwin Hubble, without hearing about any of Lemaitre's predictions, any of his math, Edwin Hubble discovers this exact fact. The great American astronomer, this is called now, we call this Hubble's Law, because he discovered it. And it had been predicted slightly before that, a few months before that, by George Lemaitre.